Welcome, Melanie. The floor, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, let me just go ahead and get set up so I can share my screen. And it's funny, I've done Zoom presentations for how long have we been in uh, Corona times? 14 months, 15 months now, and it still is uh, it still is challenging sometimes. So, all right. Well, I am so excited to have this conversation and to be here and um, to talk about why people resist becoming vegan and what we can do about this. Um, I'm really excited just, you know, I wanna start out and just say how excited I am. This conference is even happening in the first place. Um, the fact that it is, you know, I don't remember what year you said you're at and it's such a huge event with so many cutting edge, um, thinkers, thought leaders, um, the fact that this is taking place and is so well attended is really testament to the fact that the world is changing. It's opening up when it comes to these critical issues of you know, health and the environment. Um, and I'm just really honored and excited to be a part of this conversation. So if you're attending this conference, um, chances are you're already aware of the fact that scientists say we have 12 years about to make the necessary progress to reverse climate change before it becomes irreversible. And you're probably also aware of the fact that animal agriculture is a leading driver of climate change. And chances are you're also aware of the fact that eating animals is a leading cause of disease, including pandemics, and of course, of animal suffering. And chances are as well that you care perhaps very much about these issues and you feel compelled to raise awareness in others to get them to move toward a more plant-based or vegan diet. Um, so if this is the case, then there's also a good possibility that you're also aware of the fact that people, even people who are compassionate and are rational and who care about one or all of the issues I just mentioned, don't respond like this, generally, when you try to raise awareness of the problem. Chances are more likely that they react like this. People can be highly defensive against any information that challenges what they see as their right to eat animals. And so it's likely that you feel frustrated, um, perhaps even despairing because of this defensiveness. Maybe you're exhausted from trying so hard to get others to listen to your message. And maybe sometimes you even feel hopeless in the face of such resistance. And you probably also feel confused, wondering why it is that so many people, even those who care about climate change, about animals and about their own health, nevertheless eat animals and are even defensive against any information that encourages them to shift away from this pattern, to shift toward a plant-based diet. And so this is what I'll be talking about today as a psychologist specializing in the psychology of eating animals and also in relationships and communication, I will address these two questions, which is why do people resist veganism in the first place um, or plant-based eating? I'm, I'm using these terms um, synonymously today. And how can we bypass this resistance? And the information in this talk um, is largely from my, three of the books that I've written. Um, one is Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. The other is Beyond Beliefs, um, which is a guide for vegans, vegetarians, and um, meat eaters to communicate and relate more effectively. And the third one is Getting Relationships Right, which is a, a one-stop guide to building what I call relational literacy. And I'll talk about um, this concept a little bit later. Um, you can get more information, lots of free materials. I know Ben said that they'll have the website on later as well, carnism.org on carnism, veganadvocacy.org. That will link you to our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. We have a lot of free materials on all of our websites and melaniejoy.org um, if you're interested in more information about relationship building and relational literacy. So let's look at this first question. Why is it that there is such resistance to veganism? You'd think the way, based on the way some people respond simply to, by hearing the fact that, you know, I'm vegan or I, I don't eat um, meat, eggs, or dairy, you know, you'd think that we were talking about cannibalism. Um, 
So there are obviously many reasons for this resistance, but I'm going to talk about one key reason, which my research suggests it drives many of the others. And this reason is carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. We tend to assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system, but the only reason that we may learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity, which is true for many people in the world today, then it's a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. And my work on carnism emerged from my, my doctoral dissertation that I wrote on the psychology of eating animals and that eventually evolved into my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. What carnism does essentially is to teach us to disconnect from our authentic thoughts and feelings when it comes to eating those animals we've learned to think of as edible. Now, Carnism is a dominant belief system or ideology. That means that it's invisible and it's so widespread that its tenets, its teachings are literally woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. cetera, uh, becoming institutionalized. It's embraced and maintained by all of the major social institutions. So for example, when people study nutrition, they typically study carnistic nutrition. And when we're born into such an institutionalized system as carnism, we inevitably internalize it. Internalize it. Carnism becomes internalized. Um, we learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. Carnism literally shapes the way that we think and feel when it comes to eating animals. Um, I'm going to show a short video that explains, it's really quick, about three minutes long, that explains this concept of, of carnism and particularly internalized carnism. This man is eating a golden retriever burger with cheese made from horse's milk on a bun glazed with canary's eggs. He doesn't feel disturbed though, because his brain is plugged into a matrix. Like in the movie The Matrix, this matrix keeps itself alive by remaining invisible to him and it needs to make sure he continues eating these foods. It distorts his perceptions of reality, so he doesn't see a dead dog or secretions from horses or canaries. He just sees food. This is the matrix of carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals and to never question why we eat some animals, but not others. Carnism distorts our perceptions of those species we've learned to classify as edible, so we see them as food and act accordingly. Carnism is why conscientious people end up supporting an industry that unnecessarily kills more animals in one week than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history, and which is one of the largest contributors to climate change. The Matrix causes this man to be a passive consumer rather than an active citizen. Most people would recognize carnism as the global atrocity it is if they caught on to the fact that they're plugged into the carnistic matrix. They'd be its challengers rather than its supporters. So carnism teaches us to believe in myths, like the three ends of justification, eating certain animals is normal, natural, and necessary, or that farmed animals aren't individuals with personalities. So for example, we learn to believe that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And carnism makes us feel defensive against anyone or anything that helps us catch on to the fact that we're in the carnistic matrix. Ever notice how you feel when you meet a vegan? The good news is that once we catch on to carnism, everything changes. It's not that we see different things, we see the same things differently. That's awareness. And the carnistic matrix is but one of many matrices we're plugged into. And although each matrix distorts our perceptions of a different kind of individual or group, they all affect us in the very same way. So once you understand how one matrix works, you understand how they all work. With awareness, you can choose what role you play in a system. You can become an ally.
Great. So, so just to clarify, the reason carnism distorts our perceptions is because carnism is a violent or oppressive system. It runs counter to core human values, values such as compassion and justice. And most people, even those who don't consider themselves animal lovers per se, nevertheless care about animals and would not willingly support an industry that causes them to suffer, especially when that suffering is utterly unnecessary. So what carnism does is it prevents us from recognizing the contradictions in our values and behaviors when it comes to eating animals. Now the concepts that I'm talking about here, um, the psychology of carnism essentially that I'm, I'm briefly describing here, um, these concepts apply whether we're advocating veganism to support animal rights reasons or climate change, or even if we're advocating plant-based e eating for health reasons, this defensiveness against the message tends to be quite similar. And what I'm talking about here as well with the psychology of carnism, um, it actually applies more broadly. My later research after I wrote my doctoral dissertation and wrote Why We Love Dogs was on the psychology of oppression more broadly. Um, and so if you're interested in that, um, the psychology of oppression and social transformation more, bro more broadly, you can find information about this at powerarchy.org. So that was just a brief, very brief summary of the psychology of carnism and the psychology that causes people to be defensive against anything, essentially any information that would help them get outside the carnistic box that they don't realize they're in. So a lot of you can probably recognize this and relate to this experience where, you know, irrational, some of the most rational people come up with very irrational arguments, these justifications to continue eating animals. So it's, it's really important to become aware of carnism when we're advocating a change toward a more plant-based or vegan diet or lifestyle. Um, and it's also important because it's important to know the mentality of the people we're communicating with and reaching out to. And it's also important to help non-vegans recognize this psychology when we become aware of these sort of carnistic defense mechanisms, um, they lose much of their power over us. When people become aware of the way they've been conditioned specifically to think and, and feel and act in ways that support carnism, a system that runs counter to, to what they probably um, you know, would likely choose to support if they were more aware, they're much less likely to continue supporting the system. So now let's talk about you know, uh, our second question, which is you know, how, how can we bypass this resistance? The first and probably most important thing um, to, to talk about or to think about when we're communicating, when we're talking about bypassing resistance, we're talking about communicating, communicating in a way, right, that increases the chances that our message will be heard as we intend it to be heard. And it's important that we focus less on the content than on the process of our communication. All communication has these two parts. The content is what we're communicating about, and the process is how we're communicating. The process matters more, but most people tend to focus more on the content. Um, think about, for example, a conversation that you had, just imagine a conversation you had maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, maybe it was like at a party, out to dinner with people. It's possible that you have entirely forgotten the content. You don't even remember what you talked about, but probably you still remember how you felt in that conversation. The process determines how we feel. When our process is healthy, we can talk about just about anything without arguing. When our process is unhealthy, we can't talk about anything without arguing. When our process is healthy, that means our goal in a conversation is not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. And our goal is not to win, which means to make the other person lose. Our goal is mutual understanding. Our, the reason that we communicate in the first place is simply because we're not telepathic. Um, so our goal is to communicate the truth of our experience, our thoughts and our feelings, and to understand the truth of the other person's or people's experience. 
This is um, really important to think about or to be aware of when we're talking about sensitive issues such as eating or not eating animals. Typically, debate, debating doesn't work. The debate model is effective in only specific types of situations. Um, maybe in a courtroom, for example, when somebody is running for political office. When we start getting into debate mode, when we debate somebody and start trying to convince them of the rightness of what we're trying to say and invite them to debate with us, we're basically inviting them, you know, the goal of a debate is to win. When we invite somebody into a debate, we're inviting them to come up with all of the reasons that they can come up with in order to prove the rightness of their own position, in order to win the debate and prove that eating animals is the right thing to do. Studies have shown that the more people look for uh, evidence that supports their current perspective, the more entrenched they become in this perspective. When we invite somebody into a debate, we invite them to look for reasons to continue eating animals. So when our uh, process is healthy, our goal is mutual understanding. We remember that underneath the differences and <clears throat> perhaps our ideologies, um, our approaches, you know, underneath these differences is a relationship between people and that's where the focus needs to be. So we discuss rather than debate. <clears throat> We can't force people to change, but we can communicate in a way that increases the likelihood that we'll be open, that they will be open to our message so that if and when they're ready to change, they will. So really effectively advocating anything is not about changing hearts and minds. It's about opening hearts and minds, creating an environment where people will be open to our message. So don't expect the facts to sell the ideology. Facts matter, there's no question. But very often <clears throat> people hear the facts and they don't change. I'm sure that many of you listening to me talking right now can relate to what I'm saying. So often those of us who are vegan, for example, think that when we're talking to non-vegan, if only you knew the truth about eating animals, the capital T, you would never eat them again. And they, this person learns the truth and then they're at the McDonald's drive-through the next day and we're thinking like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Um, what we really need to do is to focus on just plant seeds, just plant seeds. Don't expect that you're going to, you tell people the facts, they're suddenly going to change. What we need to do is to share, and I'm going to talk about specifically how to do this, to plant seeds, to share pieces of information in a way that creates a more receptive atmosphere. Because really, at the end of the day, when we're advocating, you know, a move toward a plant-based or a vegan lifestyle, you know, what we're advocating is moral consistency, we're advocating health, we're advocating, you know, a more just uh, relationship with food, we're ad ad advocating compassion. Um, we are advocating for the very things that most people genuinely do care about and want. It's just a question of bypassing these carnistic defenses and communicating in a way that help people hear our message the way that we intend it to be heard and not become so defensive and distort what we're saying. <clears throat> when you communicate, it's a good idea to do so through sharing your own story. Um, you know, this is a picture of me and my dog Fritz um, back in, this was taken when I was, I think, four years old in 1970. And I, when, when somebody says to me, for example, oh, so, you know, why are you vegan? Why are you plant-based? You know, why are you vegan? I don't respond with all the reasons they should be vegan. Well, you know, animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change and, and, and animal exploitation. I respond by answering the question they actually asked, which is why am I vegan? Nobody can make your story wrong. This way you avoid shoulding. And when people feel shoulded, when they feel like you're trying to change them, this is when the wall starts to go up. So you share your story, keep it short, and keep it on point and ideally speak to their interests if you can. So if somebody says, why are you vegan? I say, well, first I start by saying, well, for much of my life, I ate animals actually to, to really you know, show that I do remember what it was like not to be vegan. Um, I haven't developed what Tobias Lehner, my colleague calls vegan amnesia. 
I grew up with a dog, you know, like a family member. And I also grew up eating meat, eggs and dairy. And, um, you know, for so much of my life, I never thought about how strange it was that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and, and sentient as my dog. Um, but then one day I ate a contaminated hamburger, had Campylobacter in it, and I got really sick and I never wanted to eat meat again. And as I was learning about how to cook for myself, you know, but vegetarian diet back in the 80s, um, I stumbled upon information about animal agriculture. And what I learned shocked and horrified me. And I just realized that I, I was really surprised by what I had learned. And I realized that I didn't want to participate in that anymore. Um, and if I'm talking to somebody who's really interested in health, for example, I'll throw in and I'm healthier today at 54 than I was when I was half my age. Um, so share your story, not your entire journey necessarily, keep it short, but make it about you. It's also important to know when not to advocate, when not to talk um, in order to raise awareness of the issue. Sometimes, you know, if you're that person, you're a vegan or you're, you know, on a, on a, a full plant-based diet, you just want to go to like a family dinner or you want to go to a party and you want to be you. You don't want to be a spokesperson for an entire social movement. Um, and it's really important to honor that because people who are committed to these issues that are really critical, critical issues to be committed to in our world are also people who typically are at high risk of burning out because advocating, you know, being a representative for these issues, being an ambassador, it's like the job that you never get to log off from at the end of the day. You feel like you constantly, you always have to be on, always have to be, you know, very often we can feel tokenized and we have to be perfect representations of the movement or the issue we're rep representing. Some of you might um, relate to the, the feeling of, you know, trying to hide from others when you have a head cold because you're afraid that your sniffles are gonna lead them to conclude that it's because of your diet. See, there it is. I knew you were nutrient deficient, right? When the guy next door who just had quadruple bypass heart surgery just has bad genetics. So a lot of times we just feel like we're carrying the weight of this movement and of this cause on our shoulders. And it's really important for our own sustainability to know when to step back and not ad to advocate. And you know, when you give yourself permission not to be that perfect ambassador, that advocate and representative, you invest in your own longevity as somebody who is representing a very important social cause. And that longevity is more important than you know, seizing every possible opportunity to raise awareness. And also, you know, there are unfortunately nearly 8 billion people in the world today. Many of them are not ready to move toward a plant-based or vegan diet. Um, and, and many of them are. So don't advocate to people who actually say, I don't care, or who seem really resistant to the message because that's exhausting and not a great use of time. And there are plenty of people who really are the low hanging fruit and really are open to this message and to changing. Try, I, I said earlier, um, I talked about vegan amnesia. It's important to remember, for us to remember our own carnism. Um, I, if, if you are today vegan, you know, or, or plant-based, you may have had this experience or have this experience where it's really hard for you to remember that you ever weren't. You know, it's like we stop eating animals and we feel like we were always this way. Um, but it's really important to remember your own carnism and to share your own carnism. Most people who are vegan today were not always vegan, whether we remember that or not. Um, it's when you remember your own carnism, it helps you to stay connected with the people you're communicating with instead of seeing them as other and having them see you as other as well. And we are, we are bilingual. You know, we know what it's like to live both lifestyles. So it is up to us to try to bridge that communication gap because we actually do speak both languages in a sense, um, in a way. And we are going to be the people who are gonna make the effort to bridge that gap. It's not fair, but it's just the way it is. When you can remember your own carnism, it helps you stay connected to your compassion for people who haven't made these changes 
um, you know, haven't changed their lifestyle the way that you, you might hope they would. Um, and it helps other people feel more connected to you. People continue eating animals for all sorts of reasons, psychological and practical. People don't change until they're ready to change. Often they don't change until they feel safe enough to change. Understanding that people are, you know, good people can participate in harmful practices and that doesn't make them bad people helps us, you know, to stay connected with our empathy and our compassion for others. And this, of course, also helps us to advocate more effectively. I always recommend that um, we ask people who are not vegan, that are one of our asks be to become a vegan ally. Um, and I, I, I always recommend that we try to do this. And um, we often assume that either you're vegan and you're part of the problem or you're not vegan and you're part of the solution. Um, and what this does is it prevents like 99% of the global population from supporting a cause that needs all the help it can get. Vegan Ally is a supporter of veganism, even though they're not fully vegan themselves. Some of the people in my experience who have done the most for the cause are people who are not, um, who, who still eat animals, but donate um, maybe to my organization, to other organizations that are raising awareness about these issues. They're journalists who write articles about the work that we're doing, the work that some of you out there are doing and raise awareness among, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands, millions of people. There are many, many ways that people can use their influence to help transform carnism. And when we do make an ask, I, I always recommend asking people not to go vegan, but to be as vegan as possible. Um, it's the only rational and respectful ask that we can make, right? You can say plant-based or vegan either way. Um, nobody can be more vegan than what's actually possible for them. Um, and you know, it's it, what they feel is possible for them. So this is, it's the only rational and respectful ask. When we allow people to be the expert on their own experience and decide what is possible, possible for them, we're being respectful of them. And frankly, if everyone in the world were as vegan as possible, the world would be vegan quite quickly. Um, it's also an ask that people are much less defensive against. And one of the most important things that we can do when we're advocating any kind of social change, or even if we're not, is to commit to building what I call relational literacy. Relational literacy is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating. When we are more relationally literate, our communication is much more effective. Communication is the primary way we relate. And we are in a much better position to help create the kind of compassionate, sustainable world that we want. Because at the end of the day, the problem we're working to transform is not just carnism or climate change or social injustices. It's a problem with the way that we relate. If you think about some of the most pressing problems, not only in our personal lives, but also in our world, such as uh, war, poverty, racism, patriarchy, climate change, animal exploitation, carnism, speciesism, um, you can see that they all have a common denominator. This common denominator is relational dysfunction. It's dysfunctional ways of relating between social groups, between individuals, between humans and other animals, between humans and the environment, and even between us and ourselves. We are always relating to ourselves. So if we wanna change the world, we need to change the way we relate. Um, and finally, know there's reason to hope. Um, I've been traveling a lot up until recently with COVID, um, but until then I have traveled to about um, over 50 countries now and met with people in positions of leadership, um, you know, working in plant-based and vegan uh, organizations. And, and also in the media, the mainstream media. And I have seen support for veganism and grow just, it is mushrooming. Everywhere I have gone without, without exception in the world, South Africa, Taiwan, Kuwait, I, everyone says the same thing, that support, support for plant-based vegan lifestyles is just 
mushrooming. And this is really, really exciting. I have little doubt that veganism will replace carnism one day as a dominant ideology. It's not a question to me of whether, but rather when. So I'll just end by saying a big thank you for being a part of the solution and, and for helping create a more compassionate and just and relational world. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was absolutely phenomenal <clears throat> and so meaningful uh, to so many of us. Um, I'm assuming you're Thank okay you. for the Q&A session. Yep. I have. Yes, I am. That's, okay. That's great. Thank you. In fact, I want to make sure everybody sees on the screen. It's carnism.org. A great place to go ahead and, and find out more about Melanie and all the great work she's doing. Um, what we do, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. What we do here is we take questions by raised hands. So uh, we're not able to take questions directly from the chat box, but what we do is have everybody raise their hand. So in case anybody doesn't know, the way we do this is uh, you go to your Zoom controls. You should see a tab that says reactions. You click on the reactions tab and you'll see emojis pop up. You click on the raise hand emoji. We will see your raised hand. We will select you one by one. And uh, once our tech team will actually send uh, send you a note to unmute when it's your turn, and then we'll go ahead and have you ask uh, questions of Melanie. And so, by the way, there are some people that don't have a reactions tab. I hear if that's the case, you could probably click on your participants tab and find the raise hand button there as well. So I already see a few raised hands coming in, which is great. We appreciate that. Other one other thing, folks, uh, we ask you to keep your questions relatively brief, very direct. And also, if you could just ask one question, we want to make sure that we have enough time for everybody to get their questions in. So with that, Melanie, if you're ready, we'll start popping them in. Thank you. OK, so our first question is from Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. Nice to see you again, Ben. <laughs> Melanie, I just got off the phone with my best friend who told me that he's scheduled for his first round of dialysis. How do, and he's totally unreceptive and doesn't want to hear about it. And it's brought us to really uncommunicative. I mean, we've been best friends since we're four years old and I'm watching him fall apart. He's had bypass surgery, out of control diabetes, and now his kidneys are failing. And for years I've been a broken record and it's really taken a toll on our relationship. From listening to you, obviously, I'm doing everything wrong, but there's a sense of urgency. I don't know what to do. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. And I'm sorry to hear about your friend. And I, you know, it, it sounds like a really painful situation. And I can hear that from, from your end, you know, you're trying to talk. It sounds like what you're saying is that you're trying to help him recognize the value of and the importance of, of eating more plant-based or eating a plant-based diet because you're trying to save his life and help him survive. And you're coming from a place of genuine caring and compassion. And he's not feeling, he's, he's feeling um, very resistant and, um, you know, he's not ready to, to make this change, it sounds like. So I, you know, part of people will change when they're ready to change and not before. And people love, and it sounds like you love your friend, you know, loving relationships and healthy relationships. We allow the other person to be the expert on their own experience. Meaning if somebody believes, if, so, if somebody wants to live their life in a certain way, even if that's not a way that we wish they lived and it's a way that's harming them, if we want to feel, if, if we want them to feel that we respect them as the adults they are to make their own decisions with all of the consequences that come with that and not see us as people that are trying to fix them or make them better, we kind of have to let them do that. And um, we have to let people make the decisions that they're gonna make and decide whether we can live with those decisions or not. If he is not engaging in behavior that's directly harming you and you know disrespecting you, then it's not really up to you to be in a position to dictate what he should or shouldn't do with his life. You can share with him what you believe would be helpful for him. 
and tell him why you believe this would be helpful for him. But at the end of the day, if you want to stay connected to him, you probably will have to accept that he's going to make his own choices and love him anyway, and accept that people always make choices that make sense to them because of who they are and where they've come from. All of us do this. Many of us make what seem like very irrational choices, but when we do it, they always make sense in some way to ourselves. So I, I'm, you know, it's a big question you asked and it's an important one. Um, and I, that, that's my answer to it for, for what it's worth. I wish we had four hours to talk about it, but in a nutshell. Thank you so much for that. That was very meaningful. Um, I'm gonna to go to Stephen next. Stephen, if you'd go ahead and unmute, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, just a wonderful presentation. And, you. Uh, you know, I will admit that I am not the great communicator. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got, you know, I've got family members that, I mean, they're doing okay, but they're not whole foods plant-based and they're not really interested. And, you know, what you've just said sort of helps me think about that a little bit. Um, I also have a friend like the previous caller who uh, has type two diabetes, loves the keto program, is really in decline and really doesn't want to hear. He'll listen a little bit, but it, I don't see him ready to change either. So uh, you've already commented if you want to say a few more words, but anyway, very impressive presentation and I'm going to try and get smart about what you're saying. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you talked about sort of feeling like you're, you don't always communicate as effectively as you, you wish you did, or you'd like to, you said you're not the best communicator. And I do want to speak to that. Um, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm always shocked that most of us have to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use. And we don't get a single formal lesson and how to relate in a way that's healthy and how to communicate effectively. And we all just kind of like stumble along doing the best we can, having been born into families, most of which are fairly dysfunctional relationally and into a world that is profoundly relationally dysfunctional. And so, you know, the good news is that relational literacy, which includes effective communication, is something that can be learned by anybody who wants to. Like this is my book, Getting Relationships Right, is a one-stop guide to relational, building relational literacy. You can, um, you know, you can find this information. The information is out there. It's not rocket science. So it, there, even if some of you are out there are thinking like, oh, I haven't been communicating well, my relationships have been suffering, there's most relationships, you know, most relationship, many relationship problems are not beyond repair. You can always start to build relational literacy. You can always improve your communication. You can always go back to these conversations, revisit these conversations that you've had before and say, hey, I know we didn't do that well in this conversation, but I've been thinking. I really want to let you know the reason I've been talking to you about diet is because I care so much and I understand you're going to have to make your own choices at the end of the day. I get it. It's hard for me, but I get it. So you really can, can do this and, and work on this. Um, and I can say like as a psychologist, I watch people all the time making choices that are psychologically problematic, people staying in relationships that harm them, people leaving relationships that don't harm them, people, you know, just putting things, you know, psychotropic drugs in their bodies that are, you know, harming them or whatever they may be. And, and I recognize, like, I'm not the expert on their experience, no matter how much I know about psychology, I am not the expert on what somebody else needs at any given moment in time. And the minute I start thinking that I know better than somebody else what's right for them, I believe that I'm, I'm in a position where I am not being humble enough. And relationships will improve tremendously if all of us recognize that everybody else really needs to be seen as the expert on their own experience and not perceived as needing, you know, to be taught by us or changed by us, even if we might want to share information with them that we think that could help them. Uh, Benny, Benny, if you go ahead with your question. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, I think an important reason people don't change their diet is because that's what our mothers cooked and our fathers ate and our grandparents too. How should we address these inherited habits? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same way we would address anything, you know, the same way we would address any kind of habits that people have. Habits are really hard to break. People break habits when they're ready to break habits. I eat as much as I can, a whole foods plant-based diet. I try to practice healthy, you know, relationality to the best of my ability. And I'm a fallible human being who screws up and, you know, and has to be compassionate with myself when I do that and recognize, right, that everybody is going to do, like all of us have habits that are really hard to break. And we don't break habits. Like I can't break my own habits, for example, until, until I'm really ready to break a habit. And you are probably very much the same because we're human beings. So people hold on to things for different reasons. People, most people, let me back up. Nobody, none of us is anything other than the hard wiring that we were born with and every single experience we've had throughout our lives. It, the, we are the synthesis of these things, of our minute to minute experiences and the hard wiring that we've been born with. You know, expecting somebody to be different than who and how they are is like expecting a tree that's been rained on not to be wet. I watch my family make, you know, unhealthy food choices at times and psychological choices at times. And it makes sense to me because that's what people do. People make unhealthy choices for reasons that make sense to them even if they're not aware of that rationally that these reasons make sense, that, that reasons make sense to them. So what you're asking about in terms of people's attachment to traditional foods, it's no different than their attachment in some ways. You know, it's no different than their attachment to foods with other kinds of symbolic meanings. Helping people, the more relationally literate we are, the more we create an environment so that when we're talking to the people we care about, those people feel safe in our presence. They don't feel judged by us. They feel safe and they feel connected with us and they will be much more receptive to what we have to say. And if they've received what they, we have to say and they still don't change, it's because they're not ready to change and that's their choice to make. Thank you, Melanie. Up next, we have uh, Corinne. Hi, Melanie. Hi. I'm just making the transition and I have to say, I've never heard the word carnism and especially the idea that you've made me realize that I see certain animals as food and not beings. So that is something I'm really going to think about. Um, I've had some success recently when I tell people that I've gone plant -based, whole food plant-based um, by telling people what I eat, some of the really, really good foods and recipes that I have found. And because a lot of people think you just eat salad, you know, all day long. So, um, so I try to have a few examples in my head of recent meals that I've ate that, you know, don't involve salad. But um, so I just want to say thank you very much. And plus, we are the same age. And mm -hmm. if there weren't enough reasons to go, plant-based vegan your skin alone would make me oh. want to <laughs> make the change so i'm going to head you. over to carnism.org and thank you very much thank you thanks melanie up next we have stephanie hi stephanie hello dr joy thank you for the presentation so I'm a vegan advocate with like a lot of my friends and families, especially the ones I see suffering with ailments and just think that they would benefit from it. But one thing that I get a lot um, is uh, eating meat is biblical. It's in the Bible. So God put animals on here for us to eat and that's what it's here to do. So what would you suggest to say? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are some groups that are um, uh, that actually have specific answers. If you want factual answers um, to these questions or, or specific concrete answers to to these kinds of justifications, um, I think there's a group called Christians for Animal Rights and the Catholic Vegetarian Association. You can just Google it. Um, there is some good information out there. One thing I would say 
is that often people um, refer to religion as a um, way, and I don't want to say what's true for your family, this is just what happens sometimes. People refer to religion um, as a way to avoid having to actually really engage with the, the conversation. I've never met a person who really wanted to be vegan and you know, eat plant-based and said, you know what, I just can't do it as much as I want to because my religion forbids it. God wouldn't let me. Um, generally people find a way to make their religion fit whatever they've decided they want to do. Um, so I would just share information with them, get these, this, you know, these sort of sound bites or factual information from the websites that I suggested searching for and, you know, recognize that if they really do take this information in and they really are, or they really learn the information, then, um, if they're ready to change their religion should not get in the way. And you can ask them, one of the things that I recommend is that, you know, for, for when it comes to the people in your life, you can say to them, listen, I would really like to share information about eating animals with you and about veganism with you, not because I'm trying to change you, but because I really want you to understand me and what the world looks like through my eyes. This issue is so fundamental to who I am, to what matters to me. You won't really understand me unless you understand this issue. And so that's a very safe and respectful way to get people to understand and really ask them to be allies to you because you need that. I should say that um, at carnism.org, we have videos, including that catch on video that I shared. We have a new video coming out in a few days, which is this, it's a seven minute, seven ish minute video about what the world looks like through vegan eyes and how differently we see things. And this is um, something that also we designed to be a tool to help open up productive conversations about eating animals because it's so hard to start that conversation. So we'll have that at carnism.org as well for anybody who wants to access that and use it. Thanks, Melanie, that's great. Uh, up next, we have Liesl. Liesl, go ahead with your question, please. Hi, my name is Liesl. My question was actually very close to the previous caller um, on the religious aspect. But my approach towards my family has been more on the health because obviously they don't have the animal empathy. Um, but the, the problem is the person would tell me, but they pray over the food. So, you know, whatever is in there is, is not there anymore. I, I, you know, they pray for the food. So it's like praying is going to, you know, fix whatever's wrong with the animals or the protein or the food or whatever. How do you deal with that? I didn't hear the question. Uh, sorry, there's like an echo. What is the, what, can you just say what your, your question is again? Um, okay, so the question is, I've also got family that come from the religious side of things. And the, the thing they're saying is that they pray over the food. So because I approach them from the health side, saying, you know, giving them all the information about that, uh, how unhealthy it is and what, what, you know, animal protein does in our bodies and, you know, the whole story. And the answer to that is just that we pray over the food. And obviously but, also the aspect of, of the Bible thing. Yes, yeah, so then my, my answer would be the same as what, what I had just said to the previous um, question about religion. Got it. it. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, our, up next we have Tammy. Tammy, if you'd go ahead with your question, please. And then I have time for just uh, one more question. Which is remarkable okay. because we actually have one more question. After okay. That. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your comments. I especially liked the first part of the presentation because I grew up on a cattle ranch and my dad um, was a very, is a very gentle soul and raised the animals in a way that was um, extremely compassionate. It was not big feedlots and not corporate um, ranching or farming by any stretch. And so I feel very um, deeply connected to my dad. I'm getting emotional just even talking about it. And um, I know in my heart that I need to move to plant-based and I have tried and and I've been successful on and off, not completely. Um, I still do eat some meat, 
Um, my question is, if, if you have suggestions about the programming of being um, an animal eater, and also if you have in your research seen people that have cravings for meat as they go through the transition to plant-based. And I'm sorry, that's two questions, but I have both on my mind. Um, yeah, I mean, my research was on the psychology, has been on the psychology of eating animals. So, um, I mean, and the programming is the, this carnistic conditioning that I talked about. Um, it, it's the more aware of it you are, the easier it is to sort of unblend from it and deprogram as it were. So I, I would recommend just really learning more about carnism. You can come to carnism.org. We've got a lot of resources there um, to, to raise awareness of carnism, the specific ways that it affects you. And um, I'm not a medical doctor or nutritionist, so I, you know, I can't speak to any physiological aspect of cravings. Um, psychologically, we tend to crave the foods that we associate with um, comfort and fullness and fulfillment and certain types of you know, nutrients. So it would make sense that you would have cravings for foods that you have eaten you know, throughout your life. Um, even as you stop wanting, rationally wanting to eat those foods. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was 20 and I wanted to stop eating Doritos when I learned how bad they were for me and I stopped and I craved them. My body didn't need Doritos, but I craved them because I had eaten them for years and I liked the way they taste and they were, you know, taste and they were familiar foods. So it makes sense to me that you would continue to have cravings. The cravings are normal. How you relate to the cravings is probably what's most important for you. Thank you, Melanie. We'll go ahead to our last question with Deb, Deb, if you'd go ahead with your question for Melanie Joy. Deb, just want to make sure you're unmuted. We don't see that on our end. And I think we've lost Deb. So oh, with that, oh, wait, oh, here you are, hey, Deb. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> and I'm Hi. sorry, I thought you said you were through with questions, but I was trying to type it in the chat. It's so frustrating when my sick family member is in the hospital and the meals they serve there are so bad and they say it must be good to eat because they're serving it in the hospitals and same with schools school meals are awful and your comments thank you very much great presentation thank you so um, any, any thoughts about that melanie so the, it was the question that, what is the question? I, I guess she was really getting at the fact that, you know, how do, we, how do we deal with the challenge of the hospitals and the school serving animal products and all of these mm -hmm. foods, whereas these are places where we're supposed to be getting the yeah. best and we're not. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is just testament to, to the fact that carnism is so dominant and so, so institutionalized. It's the same reason that veterinarians, you know, who have taken the Hippocratic Oath to help animals are, you know, work in slaughterhouses and eat animals and wear animals. So it's the same reason that environmentalists eat animals. Um, we have been indoctrinated to really compartment, compartmentalize and not make connections, to, to basically remain unaware of what's right in front of us. And this shows up um, you know, on, a, on an individual level. We can see this in ourselves, you know, the way that maybe we used to be and the people around us, but we see this in our institutions as well. It's um, just a massive, massive you know, quote unquote blind spot, lack of awareness um, that will, you know, that is changing. It's slowly changing, but we really need to work very hard to raise awareness, not just, not just to raise awareness of the consequences of animal agriculture on our bodies, on our planet, on the animals, but on the psychology that actually gives rise and, and you know, the, the roots of this, which is the psychology, or at least part of the feedback loop you know, the psychology that, that drives us to think in these ways and to not make obvious connections. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for all of the work that you're doing. It's phenomenal. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, I, I know that I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. Everybody, you can see carnism.org on your screen, uh, the best place to start and, and continue on with this for yourselves. 
And, uh, and I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So for any audience members out there that want to say something to Melanie and thank her as well, we're going to thank unmute you. all of them now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. That was you. so helpful. God bless you. Learning how to do work. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. God bless you. Very eye-opening. We so love much. you. Thank you.